I remember it was September of 1942. Everyone was talking about the army camp that was coming, worried about their homes being taken. We were one of those families that didn't have to move. But my brother-in-law and his whole family had to go all the way to Hackensack before they found a place to live. In 1942, the United States government seized over 1,000 acres from property owners along Western Highway, Erie Street in Blauville, and Washington Street in Japan. These property owners were compensated and were told they had two weeks to move out of their homes. In addition to the 1,365 acres from property owners, the United States government leased 675 acres of New York State-owned property and used three five-story buildings at Rockland State Hospital. That's over 50 football fields. I bet your question is, why did they do this? Well, because right here in Orangeburg, the farmland in Rolling Hills provided the least complications when it came to construction. Plus, it was close to the Hudson River. You know, so the government could build the nation's largest port of embarkation, Camp Shanks, named after Major General David Carey Shanks, commanding general of the New York Port of Embarkation during World War I. He facilitated the departure of over 2 million troops to France and their return. With World War II going on, it was essential that a military camp was built quickly. This meticulous job fell in the hands of Mr. Rosen, the ranking civilian construction supervisor of Camp Shanks. Mr. Rosen? My task was to oversee the build. Looking back, it was an impressive thing we did, building a city for 50,000 inhabitants on farmland, putting in roads, sewers with an outflow system, a water supply, and a ferry slip at Piermont in only six months. There were all kinds of racket and crime that couldn't be controlled. Crap games, equipment that was either never used, delivered, or paid for, drinking on the job. We were all proud when it was done. Cam Shanks construction workers worked for 10 hours a day, six days a week, with no overtime pay, during what Jim Witt says was an unusually cold winter. Jim? I was a meteorologist at Fleet Weather Incorporated, located on Route 52. The construction of Shanks continued through the winter of 1942 to 43. With our luck, it was an unusually cold winter. On February 16th, it hit a bitter 26 degrees below zero, the lowest official temperature in the 20th century in the Hudson River Valley area. In addition to the land the government seized and leased, the army closed and fenced off these areas, as well as shutting down the local firehouse, store, post office, and only left one church open. In addition, we were lucky enough to not have to move out of our home, or so I thought. I don't know if I'd prefer to have moved or deal with the constant sounds of trains moving all night. Once the troops moved in, they marched through our yard and ruined our lawn with their trucks. It was difficult to get around. Gas was being rationed because the camp needed it and space on the buses was scarce because they gave priorities to the soldiers. We tried working as volunteers at the Nyack Hospital, but gave up because we never could get on the bus to get there. Construction workers at Camp Shanks, as well as the soldiers, often helped out their neighbors whenever they could. A victory center for the soldiers opened in back of where the Orangeburg Diner is now. About 20 churches got together and purchased this house. Each night, a different church would open it up, bring refreshments, and entertain the troops. Whenever a church couldn't make it, my family would get a call and be asked if we could take over the Victory Center for the night. We had ping pong tables, played the piano, did all kinds of songs and hymns, and a 15-minute Vesper service. I still hear from two of these men who came to the center back in those days. Practically, over 1.3 men and women passed through Camp Shanks during World War II. The camp was coined the name Last Stop USA because it was the last place in the United States that 1,362,630 men and women came to before they were shipped overseas to Europe and North Africa 
to help with World War II's war effort. The camp opened in January 1943, and it was closed to local residents, the press, and the public until the censorship lid was lifted in 1945. The accounts you have heard and will be hearing are first-hand accounts of those that have either worked or lived in Camp Shanks or Shanks Village. If you would like to learn more, please visit the Orangetown Historical Museum and Archives Shanks Legacy Exhibit. We were assigned to one of the new, unopened areas where carpenters were putting the finishing touches on buildings in Shanks. Each building had 50 windows. <clears throat> each window had four panes of glass. Pasted on each pane was a paper sticker about an inch square. Our job, to scrape at these paper stickers off. I believe it took two weeks to remove the 20,000 little pieces of paper from every building in the area. Then we spent a week setting up the bunk beds in each barrack then another week putting mattresses on, and a third week putting the covers on. As one can imagine, the over 1.3 million persons that pass through come from various backgrounds. Let's have a look at a few. Private Mercer Ellington, son of Duke Ellington. Private Nicholas Heronasi, former court master of the Budapest Symphony Orchestra. Corporal Jerry Glondi, National Soccer Champion, Sergeant Robert Lieb, Broadway actor, stage manager, and producer, Technician 4th grade Bob Mayers, Commercial artist, landscape painter, and member of the Walt Disney staff in Hollywood, Sergeant Joe Lewis, World Heavyweight Boxing Champion. I speak on behalf of my father-in-law. His name was Howard. He was mixed race, and they always classified him as black. When he went into the army, he was second class, saw no combat, became quartermaster and moved goods. Shanks was segregated. But when he went to England, he said it was like he was in a different time. Everybody mingled. One time, he was mistaken as white. They put him in with the white section of the train, gave him a rifle, and was told to escort a prisoner of war. They even told him he would, could change his classification to white. He refused, of course. He also refused to become a sergeant when asked. Nevertheless, he was a patriot, an honorable man, and a poet. In addition to the average of 5,021 enlisted men and women, 387 officers, a dozen warrant officers, and 57 nurses, Camp Shanks also employed an average of 1,500 civilian workers. Our work week consisted of eight hours a day, six days a week, until August 1945, when Saturday was made a half day of work. I was a window clerk at the Camp Shanks Post Office at Orangeburg and received a registered letter from the War Department addressed to Major General James M. Gavin, stamped with restricted delivery. This meant the letter had to be delivered only to the addressee and no one else. A notice was sent to the general, yet a lieutenant came and asked for the letter. I explained restricted delivery to him, and he left. After him came another lieutenant, a captain, a major, and another lieutenant. Of course, the answer was still no. Finally, a staff car pulled up along Western Highway that afternoon, and in walked Gavin himself. I was working for the Western Union at, Ho at Hoboken Piers when I was put in charge of the office at Camp Shanks. I remember one Sunday, word came down that a large shipment of troops would be arriving in camp that day. Usually, there was advance word of these rivals, allowing the office to have sufficient money on hand to cash money orders which the soldiers would be receiving from home. We were in a pit, but luckily the Army's finance office came to the rescue with $50,000 in cash. We exchanged the cash for a Western Union check to cover the missing money. The men were also busy enjoying their leisure time. On base, they had a gymnasium, bowling alley, movie theaters, a post exchange, free golf lessons, 
a boxing team, and a baseball team. Ah, the baseball games on the diamond near St. Dominic's. The team usually played against other military posts. Sometimes we would play against professional teams, too. We played against the Chicago Cubs, the Brooklyn Dodgers, and the Boston Red Sox. Other amenities located on Shanks Base were four segregated USOs. A USO is a nonprofit charitable corporation. They provide live entertainment and social activities for the members of the United States Armed Forces, as well as their families. Broadway and Hollywood would come to the camp and provide entertainment for the troops nightly in the amphitheater. They had stars visit, such as Judy Garland, Helen Hayes, and Frank Sinatra. In addition to the USOs, Camp Shanks also had an amphitheater. It was located where the Orange Town's shopping center is now. As one can imagine, comedy would be pretty good amenity to have during a time of war especially for the soldiers. One source of comedy they had was a musical that premiered at Camp Shanks, whose script was later shipped out to units overseas. Theater figures prepared the musical About Face. It premiered at Camp Shanks. It was a series of skits that spoofed army life. U.S. military personnel were the actors. Huh, imagine that along with the script. Instructions on how to perform it and song seats were also shipped out to units overseas. Actually, our very own privates, Frank Lesser and High Zaret, wrote several of the songs. Yes, yes, I was born in 1907, which gave me just enough years to collect sufficient ills and wheezes to be rejected by the Army for World War II. Luckily for me, as I became a cartoonist, one day I was doing a show at Shanks, drew some pictures, did some patter, and the audience made not a sound. No laughs, nothing. As I left the stage, I told the stage manager that I had bombed. That's when he told me the crowd had not understood a word I had spoken. They were Italian prisoners of war. I hadn't noticed the small POW armbands they wore. If they wanted to, the men could take a bus, ferry, train, or taxi from Shanks to as far as 167th Street and Broadway in Manhattan, or as close as Nyack. I was a volunteer, a teenage hostess in the Officers Club in Nyack. Nyack alone drew around 1,600 soldiers on its streets every night. For many of the boys, it was their last night in the U.S. My girlfriend and I used to go and watch the men at the bar. Girls of the city operated there, picking up a guy in a one-night stand, then marry them through the local justice of the peace. And the next day, the guy was off, and his true love was left to collect the allotment checks. For these guys, it was do or die. Who knew if they'd return? And who was going to tell them that the great love of their lives was a hooker and had about five different husbands? Shanks troops were transported via the Piermont Pier down to the docks at Hoboken and Manhattan. But in the colder season, they were taken down on small river boats instead. To ensure the troops and camps safety, these departures were always kept secret. And we owe that all to Mr. George Bernstein and his crew. George? After entering the Army in World War II, I became part of the Shanks Public Relations Department. One of the first things I did at Shanks was visit the offices of 73 daily and weekly newspapers within a 50-mile radius of the camp. It was imperative that I had them all agree in cooperating and keeping the troops' movement a military secret. Camp Shanks had a weekly newspaper titled The Palisades. It was tabloid in size and usually about four pages long. It was printed in Nyack on the journal news presses, and 5,000 copies were printed every Thursday night for distribution Friday morning. The staff was mostly all professional journalists and cartoonists in civilian life. I founded the Palisades and was the editor until I was discharged. 
Sometimes I would publish news that even the headquarters had, hadn't even heard yet. The stories that I thought would harm the camp, I didn't publish. Over time, I became friends with the GIs, becoming their most powerful ally. Occasionally, an irate officer would come into our office and complain about a story. After I put on my charm and provided an explanation, the officer would leave with a smile and thanking me. After my discharge, I never went back to the newspaper business. I changed my name from George Bernstein to George Bennett and started a highly successful public relations career. The Palisades had a cartoon strip called Mail Call. It was never released a civilian publication for seven years, well after World War II. We wanted the service people to have a comic character that would be exclusively theirs. The strip's main character was Miss Lace. Her name was short and easy to remember. She had a figure and hey, a pretty girl was something nice to look at, even if she was only a paper doll. The title, Mail Call, chosen for its obvious twist on the familiar phrase. Another cartoon strip for the Palisades was done by Bill Wenzel. I was one of the paper's cartoonists. I was noted for the girls I drew. Their sexy dimensions made the paper popular throughout the camp. Originals were posted on walls as display in various offices all over the camp. I was married and selling cartoons on the side, marketing them in New York City. I managed to find an abandoned house on the post and made it my studio. When people asked what my wife thought about all these sexy cartoons, I solemnly told them that my wife is my agent. After the war, my cartoons continued in publications such as This Week and Esquire magazine. It was the afternoon of my birthday. George stopped all work and called me to the center of the office. Keep in mind, the main hallway's wall was glass. So at a nod of his head, George had six or seven girls, heavy with lipstick, come into the office. They and everyone in the office grouped around me and sang happy birthday. I had bright imprints of red lipstick kisses on my mouth, cheeks, and forehead, and even the balding spot on the top of my head. I hadn't even gotten to the good part yet. George was facing the window next to the hallway, and I saw him blanch. His face was white, his mouth moved, but no words came out. I turned and saw standing in the hallway Colonel Kenna G. Eastham, the commanding officer of Camp Shanks. He came in the office, and we came to attention, and the girls left. Colonel asked us what was going on. His voice was stern, but there was a twinkle in his eye. George explained it was my birthday. Colonel Eastham looked at my lipstick-smeared face and grinned and said, carry on, he said, and left. Yeah, we returned to work. Women were also welcomed into the Palisades office. When I graduated from college, I was too young to go overseas, so I joined the WAX. When I arrived at Camp Shanks, I was the only person in my group that was not immediately placed in a job. And then I got the flu while waiting for placement. One day, while I was still ill, a master sergeant appeared at my bedside. He introduced himself as George Bernstein of Public Relations. He told me that once I got better, I could work for him. It was a privilege to work in public relations. It was pleasant, informal, and had some freedom of movement. I was reworking a paper I had written in college, and one morning I found it pinned on the wall. One part of my job in public relations was to report for our newspaper. The other part was to interview each whack upon her arrival and send a release to her hometown newspaper. We didn't send the stories consisting of drama, difficulties, and strains. We never mentioned the one woman who joined the day after she learned her husband was taken prisoner by the Japanese, nor those that joined out of plain loneliness. Speaking of women working in the Army, it's about time to mention the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. It was established in 1942. A year later, its name was shortened to the Women's Army Corps, and women that enlisted became known as WAX. The first WAX arrived at Camp Shanks in early 1943. They lived in one of the seven staging areas in Camp Shanks the only area they were allowed to be in. Men were not allowed unless registered. At its peak, there were over 400 women enlisted, filling in 80 different kinds of jobs. 
Joy Fink. I was a captain within the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps during World War II. The group of women I was in charge of were preparing to be shipped out, and I allowed each of them to pack one article of personal civilian clothing. Of course, I held a final inspection before they left to make sure none of the girls were packing more than she was allowed. Upon inspection, I discovered Sergeant McKee had packed a nightgown, as well as a red petticoat. After explaining that she must choose one, Sergeant McKee picked the nightgown. My group of women and I were on our journey down the Hudson, dressed in our little Abner boots, field jackets, and helmets, when something caught my eye. Sergeant McKee was standing by the railing with her khaki skirt blowing in the wind, revealing her precious red petticoat underneath. I laughed out loud. If she wants it that bad, I thought, I'm not going to spoil her little plot. After all, she hadn't packed it. Barbara Herman. By the time I arrived, the atmosphere of the camp improved. We women were accepted. I think the only places we were allowed, besides our places of work, were the roads between detachment quarters and headquarters, the hospital, the library, and the theater. Enlisted personnel, of course, were not allowed to date officers. We lived about a mile away from headquarters, so if you missed the bus and had to walk, you ran a gauntlet of whistles and wolf calls from every truck that passed. It was a familiar experience to be awakened around 2 a.m. by the sounds of tramping feet and whispered commands. We would often stand by the roadside to wave at the troops as they passed. More than anything, this sound of marching in the night as the soldiers set off for the fighting in Europe is my most haunting remembrance of Camp Shanks. There was a wave of excitement when we heard the restrictions on wax have been lifted. Now we can date station complement personnel. When a soldier arranges a date with a WAC, she must register his name and organization at her orderly room by 6 p.m. that evening. A list with all the men's names will be turned over to the sentry at the entrance to the WAC area, and he shall not permit other men to enter the area or remain in the vicinity. Mondays through Thursdays, the men could call for dates in the WAC day room between 7.30 and 8 p.m., but could not remain in the day room. Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, they could remain in the day room until 11.20 p.m. On all nights, we could go to a movie or any other activity on post. There were also thousands of healthy, happy troops that came home. They had a steak dinner and all the fresh milk they wanted at the Shanks Mess Hall went to the movies, and made that phone call to the folks to tell them the happy news. 10,000 wounded soldiers were brought monthly direct from New York Port of Embarkment Piers. 50 of us New York telephone operators, all volunteers, performed dozens of acts far beyond our call of duty daily. All telephone calls for the returned wounded were handled by us. The recoil smashed against us, but with a new group coming in every three or four days, we had to learn how to handle these men. Sometimes we would offer a shoulder or shut a booth door and see that nobody disturbs a man in the midst of agonizing cry. The most enjoyable part of our work at Camp Shanks was meeting homecoming troops. We would meet them at the Piermont Pier. It was thrilling to see the boys march from ship onto the harbor boat with their duffel bags. When they dropped them, we asked, what do you have there, soldier? They would answer, half of Germany. Pets were off limits on ships, but the boys nevertheless managed to bring back every kind of dog imaginable. One exhibited two chickens and another a deer. Once, a soldier dropped his bag carefully. His carefulness wasn't common among them, so I asked him, what do you have in there? He invited me to look, and inside I saw a 12-year-old boy with a uniform cut down to his size. You know what? Quarterly reports were also submitted by the camp's public information office, detailing significant events at Shanks to headquarters in Brooklyn. The special service reports for the second and third quarters of 1944 which gained photos and particulars of the production of About Face and Shank, are also missing. Camp Shanks greatly changed the local area. When the government informed residents they had two weeks to move off their land, 
They not only provided them with payment for leaving their homes, but they also provided these residents with priority in buying back their homes after the war. But... Many of those who lived there earlier when they returned and saw the ruined condition of their former homes decided not to come back. My brother-in-law, sister-in-law, and her husband came back and spent several thousand dollars to put the house back in shape. The house withstood the bad treatment better than some of the others. There are new roads and modern homes now all over the old campsite. The woods in front of our house are gone. We now have a manufacturing plant there. The off-track betting office stands where the church once stood. The old church was destroyed by fire, set by vandals. The bell was stolen. It was an experience we hope we never have again. We pray for no more war. On May 3rd, 1946, the War Department announced that Camp Shanks would be converted to housing for GI veterans and their families, while they are students at colleges and universities in the New York metropolitan area. The converted barracks into housing turned Camp Shanks into Shanks Village, the largest veteran housing complex in the nation. Marie Kessler, my husband had just come from the service and we didn't want to live with his parents and our three kids, so Shanks was the best place to go. We needed a place to live. There would be no housing available unless you went to Shanks. We had a three-bedroom. It was small and on one floor, but it had a nice kitchen, dining room, living room, and a little front and backyard. You couldn't help but be close to your neighbors. After all, it was just the barracks turned into housing. There were three houses in each barrack. Each section was its own neighborhood. The fellows had just come back from service, so they were used to community living. It was really nice family living. Everyone was in the same boat, so everyone did things together. If you needed help or anything, your neighbor was there. It didn't matter if you were white, black, yellow, or what. Everyone got along. We lived there until the village was closed. Once we started moving out, a lot of people either moved to New City or stayed here in Orangeburg. You kept your friends, lost them, or made new ones, but living in Shanks was really very nice. If you've never done it, it really is a whole new existence. Shanks Village was closed in 1966, and the land was sold to a private builder to be used for housing. The legacy of Camp Shanks and Shanks Village is memorialized in a special exhibit at the Orangetown Historical Museum and Archives. From last stop USA to today, Orangetown has shown a humanity of spirit that marks our lives.